Well, welcome to our Sunday evening service, and we're glad that you're back with us again. We're always excited about traveling the world with Jesus. You know, it's a wonderful thing. I listened to a radio program just this last week, and a man called in. He said, you know, I have been a Christian for 20 or 30 years, and I have never understood this when people say, may the Lord go with you, or may the Lord be with you. What does that mean? And for just a minute, the man who was hosting the radio station, or the show, was puzzled. You could tell he it was, it was like a dead silence. And he said, you, you've known the Lord for all these years, and you don't know what that means. He said, no, that doesn't make sense to me. And he said, well, I'm just going to tell you from my point of view. He said... I can tell you there's days when it doesn't feel like Jesus is with me. And I can tell you other days when his presence is so close that I didn't care what happened. It was just good to be with Jesus. He said, I assume that maybe that's what you're trying to understand. And so when people are saying, may the Lord go with you, maybe that's what they're thinking. Not that the Lord ever leaves a a Christian. But there's times when we get away from God and there's times when we turn away from God. Wouldn't it be a good thing we just walk with Jesus all the time? Look at page number 193. You don't have the book, but it's got Jesus and me, and the words will be up there for you. Let's sing all three verses. I traveled alone upon that lonesome my burdens were heavy, and dark was my day. I looked for a friend, not knowing that he had all of the time in looking for me. Now it
One of the things that uh, I remember in my life is going to work in the full-time ministry, first time. Now, you've heard my testimony and went to a pretty good-sized church, Brother uh, Ron Schaefer pastored the Temple Heights Baptist Church, and he allowed me to go to work for him, kind of. And uh, it was a great experience. Nothing quite like it, going from a church that had <clears throat> six or seven. One time we got up to 13 people in it. And going to work at a church, the first day I was there on Sunday, they had 60 infants in the infant nursery. It was a huge church. This was their theme song, and God seemed to make it possible for everything. I don't know what God does with His plan, but I know this. When I walk with the Lord, whether I like what happens or don't like what happens, I can always be assured God's in charge. Amen? Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. We're going to sing it through, and then I want to sing it, and I want to hear you guys at home sing it with me. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in His Word. Hearken to the voice of God to be. Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon His Word. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in His Word. How can the voice of God to me? Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon His Word. For every 
Welcome back to the Sunday evening service. I know you enjoyed that special with the girls. We enjoyed watching it be done. It was a lot of fun. Nothing like siblings. They look really good, don't you? It's a, you know, that's, that's a strange thing because that's kind of what I'm going to talk about tonight about what and how do we act if we know somebody's watching. And after a word of prayer, I'm going to explain to you where we're going to and, and why I'm preaching what I'm preaching. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for your grace. And Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to serve you in any way we can. And Lord, we're watching and you're blessing and you continue to supply every need. Lord, I pray that you would do that and make those that are out there, Lord, in need, understand where their help comes from and help us, Lord. Help us to know who to help and what to do and who to call and who to speak with. And Father, we ask you for grace in using us in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who do know, because this is a Sunday night service, and I'm sure there's a lot of people watching who are not members of our church, but good to have you with us. God bless you. Uh, one of our ladies, her uh, stepdad just passed away, and her mother asked her a question. They're taking care of all those things that happened in the loss of a loved one. And so I'm answering her question tonight. She called me and asked me the question, and there are sometimes people who ask me questions, and... Uh, I I have a personal opinion, but I would rather be able to give you what the Word of God has to say. And so, as easy as I know how, and this kind of ought to be fun a little bit tonight, okay? So if you're looking for something as serious as this morning's sermon, you're probably going to miss it tonight. But we're going to, a lot of truth, but a little easier, okay? Are people in heaven able to see what we're doing right now? Can my dad watch me? And I will tell you this right up front. Um, I have been caught. My wife will ask me every once in a while, who are you talking to? Well, most of the time I'm talking to God. Just uh, I assume God is with me all the time. I assume He hears everything. He sees everything that I do, which is what the Bible teaches. I'll show you. And so I, I just have a tendency just to talk to Him. Okay? Every once in a while, though, I had this great, wonderful father and a great, wonderful mother. Every once in a while, I'll be doing something that they particularly were wonderful at or good at, and just kind of lightheartedly, as if they were watching over me, I'll say, is that good enough? Is that okay? And most of the time, that's because uh, when I was a younger guy, my dad was a finished carpenter, and he could make two sticks into a beautiful piece of furniture. And, and not, uh, It's a little exaggeration, but not much. And he would always watch the work that I did when we were building or moving or making, and he would tell me these two things. You can't hammer and you can't saw. And so I was trying to think about what that meant. I got older. I just It wasn't that I couldn't do them. I just couldn't do them as good as he could. And so we still laugh. When he get to heaven, I don't know if the Lord lets him see all that. But in the meantime, I'm going to show you what the Bible says as far as I can tell about what God allows to go on for being seen. And so I kind of named the, the lesson. If you're watching, you see it on the screen. It is, who is watching us right now? Who is watching us right now? And I'm just going to jump right in. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. I can't think of a better place to start. And this is a wonderful thing. Whenever scholars are talking about the book of Hebrews, they'll be careful to tell you that we do not know who wrote this epistle? But whenever they're trying to put an authority behind the verse, they will be absolutely quick to say, now the Apostle Paul said in verse 1 of chapter 12, and it says this, Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And he's making an analogy as if you were running in a track meet. Now, who is watching us? Well, just right off the top of my head, I can tell you that believers under constant scrutiny. Somebody's watching us all the time. The devil's watching you because he wants to destroy you. Most of you can quote that verse, Luke twenty two thirty one. Because it's the Apostle Peter listening to the reprimand of the Lord, or at least encouragement of the Lord, or something, when he said, 
Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. He said, okay, but I have prayed for you. When you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Now you think about that a little bit, and if the devil wants you, it's not because he likes you, it's because he hates you. But if he's after you because of what God could do with you, then you probably are worth a little bit of value to the Lord, and the devil knows that. The devil watches you to destroy you. Number two, the world watches you to condemn and to contemplate. What verse would you put on that? How about Matthew 5, 16? Everybody knows it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The, the saved people watch us. Saved people watch us. Now, I want you to understand something, that one of the hardest places to go in your whole life if you're saved is to go off to a Bible college. Because we assume that everybody in Bible college, their only desire is to be right with God, right? Well, if you go to a Bible college, you find out that's not true pretty quick. But what happens is a lot of the weaker ones watch those who are doing what they're not supposed to do and they fall victim just like those do in our church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 10, Paul said this, he said, Ye are witnesses, God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. See, we're, we're responsible to understand that people who are saved are watching us. You really don't want to discourage them. The Lord watches you. The Lord watches you. Mark 10, 29 Peter again said, Lord, we've left all. What will we have? And Jesus answered him. Now listen to me. He answers him with the understanding of saying, God sees everything you're doing and why you're doing it. And Jesus answered, said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that have left houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but you shall receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Now, if you read that, he said, the Lord has to be watching us if he's going to reward us with some kind of thing right now that we've earned and to give it to us and to, to replenish whatever we've given up. And he's promised that he would do that. The devil's constantly watching you. He is constantly watching you. 1 Peter 5, excuse me, 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible says, For be sober, be vigilant, that means watch out. For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, you know what an adversary is? Somebody that's against you. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's just waiting out there for you to let your guard down. Just waiting to let your guard down. And then the Bible says he wants to use you as a wall, listen to me, as a, as a blank, a blinding point. He wants to use you as a, as a dark room. He wants to use you not as a window, but as a solid wall to keep those around you from seeing what Christ has done within you. Every one of us are saved, we're born again, on our way to heaven. We're new creatures. Can I tell you, you can hide that. You can hide him. And Paul said it this way, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them who are lost and who the God of this world have blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. And I'm telling you the number one way that happens is when we watch people who are supposed to be Christian live like they're not. He watches constantly because he wants to see who's the biggest target. Now, I talked to you about Peter. He's a pretty big target. Do you know that the Bible says in the book of Job chapter 1, something I, I hope the Lord never challenges the devil to for me. He said, The Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And I want you to get this. The devil never said, mm, never thought about it. The next verse says, And Satan answered the Lord, Doth he fear God for naught? And he said, you put a hedge about him. You blessed him on every area. Had he been watching him? You betcha he had. People around you are watching you. People around you are watching you. And, and you say, well, I don't care what people think. 
First of all, I know that's not true because number one, your children are watching you. Your grandchildren are watching you. Your great-grandchildren are watching you. If you say, well, I don't have any of those. Well, I do, and I want you to be a testimony around them. My Bible says, train up a child, Proverbs 22, 6, in the way he should go when he is old, he is not depart from him. Do you know what I believe? I'm not sure that most of life is taught as much as it is just caught. Nobody ever walked up to you in this time and say, hey, you want to have the COVID-19? No, didn't have to teach it to you. It's caught, kind of like that. That's the way a lot of the things we learn in our life. A lot of the things we talk. Have you ever noticed if you have a father, mother, they have a certain kind of accent that the kids pick that up pretty quick? I don't think they sat down and said, now, you say this word just like this. We train up our children because they follow our example. In Ephesians chapter 4, he said, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. We go out of our way purposely to change the way we act so that it doesn't interfere with God being able to use our children. Your children are watching. Your brethren are watching you. You're watching you. You know, I'm, I guess I'm amazed. The longer I'm saved, I'm more amazed at how many people watch me. I've had people from years back call and say, you know, that one time when you talked to me, and I want you to know something, folks. A lot of times I don't remember. And I'll go, no. I have people come to me and say, preacher, you remember that time when I was... 12 and you were preaching in this town and you no nope. but they do you said this and it touched my heart they do they they see it my brother bible says this in chapter 8 verse 13 of first corinthians paul saying if meat make my brother to offend i will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest i make my brother to offend and that's some of the simplest things, okay? What could be more simpler than eating? Uh, and, and I know that we're, and Americans, we're not much offended in stuff with things we eat, unless you're offended by what I eat, okay? And I always tell you, right out there and right up front, for those of you who don't know me, I'll be the last man standing because I eat anything and everything and it doesn't matter. But I want you to understand this too. If whatever that was offended my brother, I wouldn't do it in front of him. That's not just for eating meat, though. It's anything that I offend my brother, my brother in Christ, my sister in Christ to do. I don't want to do that. It's bad enough just being the preacher and having to make sure that we tell all the truth all the time. And sometimes that's hard for a lot of people to swallow. Philippians 4.9, though, says this. These things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, then the God of peace shall be with you. Now, I learned something a long time ago, but I learned it after I raised kids. And that is that kids will do in excess of what I do with restriction. If you don't think that's the truth, how much do you use your computer, your phone, your stuff, as much as your kids do? Now, my mom used to say, if you can't get up in the middle of your television, favorite television show, and go do what you're supposed to do, then you're probably not doing the right thing. Well, I'm telling you, I understand that now. But I watch it, and I watch people who are addicted to that, and they, they couldn't do without a television. We're, we are, we're, we're watching, we're showing, we're living, we're teaching, we're training. And your brethren are watching you. Your neighbors are watching you. Your neighbors are watching you. Uh, every once in a while, one of my neighbors will tell me something. They, they'll say, you know, we're amazed at, at, at you. I said, well, yeah. One of them told me one time, he said, you know, <clears throat> for a long time, I thought you like had a twin brother. Because one of you would come in dressed one way in a suit or something and or we'd come in dressed in work clothes and then just a few minutes the one in the suit would show up. And I, 
I said, well, it's just me. Different job. Your neighbors are watching you. Your, the folks around you are watching you. Your co-workers are watching you. But it says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that wherein they speak evil of you of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. The Lord's watching them. The Lord sees everything, everywhere. Everything, everywhere, He sees. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. The Lord sees everything that a lost person does. Revelation chapter number 20, verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Can I tell you this? The Lord sees everything that His children do too. Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward His name and that you ministered to the saints and do minister. But wait, it didn't, do, didn't just stop there. Now listen, look at this verse. You might want to pick up your Bible. Mark it sometime. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, just about 7 or 8 verses. For no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Okay. We know it's all saved people. If any man build on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall tell every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Now I'm going to stop there just a little bit. He said we'd have some works that would have eternal value and they would go through that. And the ones of no eternal value are the ones we shouldn't have done. Guess what? He just burns them up. We don't carry them with us. Don't we have a great God? Yeah. Even though He knows it all. And of course the angels are watching you. I, I want you to know that I, I believe that God gives every one of us angels. You see, where does He get them all? My Bible says there are innumerable I, I thought of that. It means not countable, okay? Jesus was careful to tell those around him, he said, take heed that you despise not these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. I believe, guys, that's from the time we we're conceived till the time that we step back into the presence of the Lord. Do you hear me? All those times. Chapter number one of the book of Hebrews, it says, here's what they are. They are ministering spirits. To minister to me, you've got to know what I need. It says, but to which of the angels saith he at any time, sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. What he's saying, they don't compare to the Lord Jesus. He's the Son and He has a position right next to the Father. Are they not all ministering spirits? Aren't they just servants created by God, sent forth to minister to them who should be heirs of salvation? He said, you know what their job is? Take care of us. Luke 16, it said, It came to pass, the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. When I was a kid, I used to hear my mom say this all the time. She was 10 years old when her dad went to heaven. So I never got to meet him, of course, but I remember her telling over and over in those times that she'd be contemplating her father. She'd say, he called us all into the room and he'd been sick for a long time. And he sat up and he, he said, I'm going to tell you goodbye now. It's getting time for me to go. The angels are already here to take me. And she asked me, she said, do you, do you believe the angels come towards us? Yeah, I do too. I, I cannot count the number of times that I've been with a child of God and watched their face light up like they see something I don't see. I've had them actually say, well, got to go now. The angels are here. And close their eyes. 
I believe they're with us from the time that we're conceived to the time God does with us whatever we do. So you have the question. You say, do people in heaven get to see what's going on on the earth? <clears throat> I'm going to make a statement. I hope not. That verse in Hebrews, a lot of people say the way of the great cloud of witnesses. I think he's talking about the folks of the past who are going to watch it and those out there and the angels. And Okay, that's my opinion, okay? Could it? I have no proof whether or not they can or can't. I'm just thinking about um, making a video and I try to act a little bit different when I'm being recorded than I do when it's just being put out there and somebody's memory has to keep it going. I grew up in a time that um, TV was live. Do you remember really live TV? They had this guy named Art Linkletter. All you older people remember him. He had this show saying, kids say the darndest things. And my, da my dad liked to watch it, and so we got to watch it. That's all we got to watch, whatever my dad watched. And I remember him asking the three or four kids, he'd line them up and he'd ask them all the same question. And he asked, what is the first thing that your father does when he gets up in the morning? Now, because I'm videoing this, I'm not going to tell you the answer, but you can imagine it in your heart, okay? I'm not thinking that I want all those people in heaven to see everything that I'm doing all the time. You say, well, maybe God filters out all the bad stuff. Then they get to see 10% of what we're doing, right? I don't know the answer to that. But I found the greatest authority that I can know on this subject. Okay, you ready? And it is this. Heaven is a place of total happiness and peace. We can be confident that our loved ones who have gone before us into heaven are not disturbed or upset over the evil things that happen here on the earth. The Bible does not clearly tell us if people in heaven are able to observe what happens on the earth, all there are some hints that they do. In the book of Hebrews, for example, the writer calls the great men and women of faith have gone before us and now in heaven. Then he adds, since, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Like spectators in an arena, he seems to suggest they're watching and cheering us on as we seek to follow Christ. Never forget that heaven's main focus is Christ. Even if those in heaven see some of what happens here, they now see it from God's point of view. And they know that someday the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14 Thank God for the hope we have in Christ, a hope that is based squarely on Jesus Christ, that He did for us through His death and resurrection, what He did for us through His death and resurrection is your hope and trust in Him. Billy Graham's statement. Can they see what we do? And I want you to understand, I've read this about six or eight times, and it is extremely um, careful not to answer you yes or no. And I'm going to tell you, can they see what we're doing? Maybe, but the Bible never tells us exactly. I hope that blesses your heart.